Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. This may come as a shock, but many scholars consider the Beatles to be one of the most influential bands in the history of modern popular music. I know, wild, right? Anyway, a while back we analyzed Blackbird, but the Beatles catalog is just so deep and full of interesting stuff that I figured it was time to take another look with a very different song of theirs, Hey Bulldog. It starts like this. And this opening riff just screams blues, and there's a good reason for that. It's in the blues scale. This is a scale built by taking the minor scale, removing the two most dissonant notes to create what's called minor pentatonic, and then adding an extra bonus note here. This added note is a half step away from both the fourth degree and the fifth, and it's a tritone above the root, so it brings back all that dissonance, but in a slightly different way. This added tritone plays a big role in the opening riff. Here, check it out. The other thing I want to mention about this riff is its use of the root note. It starts by playing it twice, and it features prevalently throughout the entire thing. I see this a lot in heavy bluesy riffs, probably most famously this one from Crazy Train by Ozzy Osbourne. I think this works because the root note is the most stable note in the key, and also usually the lowest note in these riffs, so leaning on it like this helps the whole thing feel grounded and powerful. That's... My theory, anyway. The piano plays the riff three times, and each time through we add more instruments. The first time is just John on the piano, the second time George and Ringo join in on guitar and drums, and the third time Paul fills it out with a bass line. But they're all playing the same riff, even Ringo's playing along with a rhythm. This gradual introduction of instruments helps to build energy without having to write new musical elements, and it's a great way to introduce the song. After that, we move into the verse, where the guitar drops out and we hear this. This is just two chords, but it already creates a lot of questions. Let's start with this B major. Weren't we just playing a riff in B minor? Well, yes, we were, but this is a classic element of the blues. Riffs and melodies are written using the blues scale, which has a minor tonality, but the underlying harmony uses major chords, or if you want to get fancy, dominant sevenths. This gives the blues its signature edge. It's trapped between two different emotional states, not quite happy, but not quite sad either. Just blue. So, okay, we've got major harmony, which brings us to the next question. What's up with this F-sharp minor? In a traditional blues progression, we'd expect to hear a big, fat 5 major chord, but instead we switch back to minor. I think the simplest explanation is that Lennon didn't want all the baggage that comes with a traditional 5 chord. You see, the 5 chord has what's called dominant function, which is a fancy way of saying it points you back to the 1 chord. Here, listen to it. The 5 minor, on the other hand, doesn't really have that same sort of directionality, so using it instead helps prevent any strong sense of finality or resolution because the song is just getting started. The last thing I want to highlight here is McCartney's part. A lot of the transcriptions I found said that the bass line was something like this, which is a totally fine rock bass line. It's simple quarter notes holding down the pulse and acting like a metronome, and it alternates between the root and the fifth of the chords, the two most stable notes. It works perfectly fine, and it does everything a bass line needs to do, but there's one problem. It's not what Paul is playing. A better approximation would be this. Although the MIDI recreation doesn't really do it justice, and besides, every time through he plays something a little bit different. He's experimenting and improvising underneath what is otherwise a fairly straightforward section. I mention this because it's easy to underestimate the importance of a good bassist, but more than anyone else, I think McCartney is responsible for giving this section life. Next comes the pre-chorus, which sounds like this. Again, just a couple chords, but interesting ones. We could analyze this in B minor, but I think it's best viewed as a key change. This section sounds to me like we've moved to the key of A major. We've got the one chord here, then the six minor, which is often viewed as like an extension of the one chord, and finally the five major, followed by the five seven, which as we mentioned has dominant function. A major is an interesting choice because it sits directly between B major and B minor, so it's closely connected to both tonalities. This switch is hidden by the F sharp minor we saw in the verse, which exists in both keys, helping us pivot smoothly, between the two. Anyway, the E7 at the end really wants to resolve back to A, which it does with the second half of the section, which is the same as the first, except instead of going to the E, it suddenly jumps back to B major. This stands out because B major isn't in the key of A, but again, it's prepared by the F sharp minor. After that, we go through the verse and pre-chorus again, then finally wind up in the chorus.
And at first glance, it looks like we've got a lot of different chords to deal with, but it's not actually as tricky as it seems. The whole section is based on a device called a line cliche, which we talked about in our Life on Mars video. Basically, a line cliche is when the chord stays mostly the same except for one rogue line that slowly drifts up or down in order to create a sense of motion over the otherwise static harmony. This first chord, B minor, contains a B, a D, and an F sharp, and those first two notes stay perfectly still throughout the first two bars. The F sharp, meanwhile, slowly drifts upwards to a G, a G sharp, and an A, creating a sense of rising tension without really changing the harmony. So even though it feels like it's constantly moving, the entire thing is actually just a cleverly decorated B minor chord, and this bit here does the exact same thing except we start on E minor instead. In effect, this whole section is really just two chords, even though it looks like eight. And those two chords are fairly easy to explain, they're the one and four chords in B minor. This gives us another interesting color, the verse had a bluesy major minor thing going on, and the pre-chorus was borrowed from a different major scale, but here in the chorus we've gone straight up minor. The four minor here is serving a similar role to the five minor in the verse, it's different enough from the one chord to provide motion, but not directional enough to create a real resolution. The chorus wraps up with this tag, which is just the one and four chords again, like a little mini chorus, and then... we're back to the riff. And that's pretty much it. There's a solo over the verse and pre-chorus, then another time through with lyrics, then the chorus again, then the outro, which is just Lennon and McCartney ad-libbing over the verse progression until it fades out. Before we go, though, I want to do something I don't normally do and talk a bit about the history of the song. Hey Bulldog was one of four original songs released on the Yellow Submarine album, which accompanied the movie of the same name, and by all accounts, the Beatles phoned that album in pretty hard. They viewed it as an annoying contractual obligation, and the songs they wrote for it were mostly recycled rejects. Hey Bulldog was recorded because they had a film crew in the studio anyway for another promotional video, and they figured they might as well record a real song, and it was apparently originally called Hey Bull Frog until McCartney randomly started barking during the recording and they changed the lyrics mid-song. By any reasonable estimation, this whole thing should be an unlistenable mess, but... It's not. It's a really cool take on a trippy, bluesy soundscape. I think this goes to show that sometimes stripping away the need to be perfect can actually help you make something great. At least if you're John Lennon. So that's the song, but before I finish, I wanted to let you know about another project I've been putting together over on Twitter. I'm organizing a rotating curation account where a different music educator is going to take over every week and talk about music, music education, music academia, or public music discourse. We've got some really exciting people signed up to host, including myself, Adam Neely, and Steve from The Listener's Guide, and it officially launches on Monday. Monday, so if that sounds interesting, go follow at music underscore babble, and if you want to sign up to host, there's a link to the application in the description. Anyway, thanks for watching, and thanks to Patreon patron Master Dslay for suggesting this song. If you'd like to see your favorite song analyzed, just head on over to Patreon and pledge at any level. You can also check out our store, join our mailing list, like, share, comment, subscribe, and keep on rocking.